Welcome to Pacific Bridge Medical's 2011 Singapore Medical Device Update. I would now like to turn the floor over to Ames Gross, President of Pacific Bridge Medical. Yeah, hi, this is Ames Gross, uh, President of Pacific Bridge Medical. Thank you for attending our webcast today. I'd like to just mention that on the first couple slides it says copyright 2008, but really this is copy, copyright 2011. This is all new information on the current situation in Singapore. Our speaker today is Mr. Ko, who's got eight years of medical device experience in Singapore, and we're going to have a one-hour presentation, followed by 30 minutes of questions and answers. Uh, Mr. Ko, the floor is yours. Could you please begin the presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Ames. A very good morning to everyone. I'm going to go through the whole slide. So as you can see right now, the whole outline is here, I, and you guys have seen this for the past couple of minutes, so I'm just going to jump straight into the presentation itself. So briefly, I'm just going to give an overview of Singapore. For, for those of us who, who know Singapore, it's basically a small little island just on the equator, and it's really founded a small young country founded in 1965. So most of the country itself, most of the regulations and such are pretty young, and most of them were handed over by the British, who first founded Singapore in 1890. Okay. So these are the demographics of Singapore. The population is 4.7 million, of which a quarter of the population are made of uh, foreign workers and expats into Singapore. And, and the life expectancy is 82 years, which is pretty high in the region in Southeast Asia. And the four major ethnic groups, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and also um, Eurasians, which is basically a, a race that's made out of Chinese, Malay, Malay, Indian, as such. The principal language that Singapore actually speaks in is really English, and the official language is the other official languages include Mandarin, Chinese, Malay, and Tamil. There's also a usage of other dialects in Singapore itself. One needs to also take note that the Singapore population is also an aging population, uh, which is due to the fact of a population control made by the Singapore government in the 1962. So what we have is a population that's slowly aging, in which um, the medical healthcare business becomes more and more important. In terms of the economy of Singapore, what we have here is one of the highest uh, GDP growth uh, in per capita in the whole world, which is usually about, the last count was in the top 20 in the whole world. Okay, so we have a, indeed a high uh, capital income where most people are, most health care is being provided for by the government through this thing called the MediSafe funds. All right. Okay, let's jump in, into the medical device regulations, which is really the key thing of today's presentation. And this is really a brief history of the Health Sciences Authority, and this was founded in April 2001. During the early phases of the medical device regulations, the principal aim of the HSA was really to understand the various regulations that's available in various countries such as US, the EU, Australia, Japan. And this is what we would define as equivalent to the US FDA, and it's responsible for all aspects of the medical devices, uh, drugs, blood banking, healthcare services, and also forensic services in Singapore. And the web link is as seen over there. Okay. Here we talk about the Center for Medical Device Regulations, the CMDR, which is uh, basically in charge of all the medical uh, device regulations uh, in Singapore itself. Uh, in, the, in 2007, uh, when the Health Products Act was being introduced, the, the whole um, organizational structure was being reorganized into the three main groups here, which is the blood services group, which is in charge of all blood banking and blood testing services in Singapore, the health products regulations group, which actually deals with all the registrations of not just medical devices, but also the pharmaceuticals, complementary health products, and, and also lastly, the applied sciences group, which is basically in charge of anything that deals with the forensics and application of such uh, health sciences in Singapore. I'm going to come into the specific uh, organizational structure of the health products re regulations group. From here you can see that uh, it's 
roughly organized into four main categories, of which the pre-marketing pre uh, group would probably be the most uh, relevant to our topic today. And in pre-marketing, there are several branches itself, which include um, medical device, of course, the clinical trials, pharmaceuticals, and generics and the complementary health products. Although these branches are set up to be individual branches, there is a lot of cross um, operations among these branches itself. And I mean, examples would also be in terms of evaluating medical devices, which include um, pharmaceuticals inside involving drugs, for example, drug eluding stems. Okay, so usually for most cases, for companies that deal with medical devices, they would usually first go through the medical device branch. And if the medical device branch decides that there are certain uh, aspects that need to be consulted with the other branches, they would also involve the other branches into the evaluating of such devices. Okay, um, the key personnel in HSA, I think the most important one that we, I want to highlight is the Director of Medical Device Branch, which is Mrs. Joanna Cole, who has been around for the past few years um, involving in the Medical Device Branch right now. Um, the chairperson, chairman here, Professor Edison Liu, has already changed and is expected to step down because he's moving to another um, lab in the U.S. So this position is currently vacant. Um, the other person that you want to take note of if you're involved in clinical trials is this Mr. Fu Yang Tong, who, um, of which the clinical trials uh, legislation is starting to take place and take shape in Singapore. So this is one key important person to take note of. Okay, the the health uh, the medical device branch really consists of um, a mix of uh, regulators who have industry some industry experience and also people who are also fresh out of the universities itself. Just to give you um, an idea of the demographics of the branch itself. Next, we want to deal with the registration products, the overview. Briefly speaking, the whole regulations can be broken down into three main categories, which is dealing with the actual device reg registrations and control of such devices in terms, and also lastly, post-marketing activity itself. So registration of uh, products itself, it is key that all medical devices must be registered with the HSA before it can be supplied. And we said, when we mentioned about registration here, we're talking about both approved and unapproved devices. This um, can be a bit confusing, but we'll explain later on as we come to the actual registration process in the later slides. And also, for all medical devices, after being registered and approved, there is an annual renewal of the devices that's required. And, and this needs to be done a minimum of one month before the registration expires. In terms of importing and supplying in Singapore, uh, there are three main uh, routes that the devices can be bought in and supplied in Singapore. This is mainly the true if the products are being listed on the Singapore Medical Device Register, which is something like the device listing in the FDA, a transition list, and lastly to an authorization route. One needs to be clear that the, when the terms importation and supply are very um, distinct terms that's used in Singapore. And I'll just briefly describe that importation means that the product can be brought into Singapore, but it does not include the definition that the product can be supplied to anyone in Singapore. And this is being covered by the term supply. Unlike countries that if you can bring in the product, naturally the, the supply is, is clear. But Singapore has made this distinction really clearly. And as we explain the terms in terms of the registration in the later slides, uh, I'll start to give you examples of the differences in, in the terms, okay? And next I'll talk about the supply distribution uh, chain control, which is in this case here, licenses needs to be obtained from the HSA in order to be able to supply the medical devices. The key thing here is that if if you do not have any manufacturing in Singapore, the only two licenses that you need to take note of would be the importer and the wholesaler licenses. In this case here, um, the requirements would also be discussed in the later slides. But this would, if you have a system of uh, a medical device quality system in place, this, this 
license requirements would more or less be fulfilled. Okay? And lastly, on post-marketing activity, what, what this really means is, is really anything that after you've gotten the approvals to sell in Singapore, one needs to take note of all the responsibilities of an importer and wholesaler that needs to be done. Um, last, I would also at this point add in that although it's being mentioned that HSA is the authority in terms of medical device regulations in Singapore, the other authority that, that would be involved in is known as the Center for Radiation Protection and Nuclear Sciences, which is the CRPNS for short, and this belongs to the agency, the National Environment Agency, NEA for short. And they are also involved in the medical device registrations for specific unique devices such as X-ray machines, CT scans, as the aspect of regulation that they are controlling is dealing with radiation protection. Okay, so um, when, when you are involved in such devices, it's, you need to take note of both the HSA regulations as well as the NEA regulations for this part here. Okay? Moving on to the next slide, we come to um, several definitions, and, uh, and one of these definitions here is the registrant. So before you even begin doing any submissions or registrations in Singapore, it is key that um, the registrant for the Singapore that's performing the registration for you on behalf is uh, being defined and, and done properly. In this case here, uh, this registrant here Needs to, is the actual person who would be submitting the all technical documents to the HSA. And the all submissions are actually done electronically through this system known as the MEDICS, which is the short for Medical Device Information and Communication System. So this uh, registrant would have the authority to submit uh, all the applications online. And, and I, I would like to stress also that even before this uh, med medic system is in place, the registrar needs to get the online um, password and, and the license to get onto this system through another system, which is actually known as the Client Registration and Identification Service Account, which is known as CRIS, C-R-I-S for short. Okay? And, and the person who is doing this needs to be a Singapore-based company registered with the the ACRA, basically this means that the company needs to have a proper business license to operate in Singapore. And this can be anything from a small uh, private company to a, you know, a big corporation. And this, and lastly, if you are getting a distributor to register on your behalf and if you do not have a, a company set up in Singapore, the distributor needs to obtain a letter of authorization from the product owner, which is basically the person who owns this product, to register into Singapore. And this uh, letter authorization would require the actual name of the product, the company name, and a person who can provide the authority, which can be the person who is in charge of the regulations or even the director of the company itself. I also like to add at this point in time that it it is also possible for the, in terms of um, protection of uh, confidential information. The, per the registrant can also uh, provide the um, company the rights to be able to register the documents first. And, and finally, the, that, that means the overseas company can actually do the physical input of the documents into the system, followed by the, the local registrant to, to actually press the send button to submit the documents on behalf. If, if you need any to ensure the confidential information is not being, um, you know, provided. Yeah, okay. Kelvin, I think we need to just speed up a little on the slides. Okay, sure. And we're just going to go through the definition here. <laughs> I'm not going to read out the whole chunk, but the key thing that you need to take note of is that the medical device does not include anything for vet veterinarian for animals. And the last thing is that the the last point you need to read is the does not achieve its primary intended action on by pharmaceutical means. This, this section here is basically to define and, and to define itself away from the drugs definition, which is being defined somewhere else in the, the act itself. Okay? And this definition, as you can see, I just went on the site, it actually follows closely to the MDD directive in the EU. 
Okay, classification of general medical devices here. Um, one who is uh, familiar with the medical device directive in the EU uh, would find this rather familiar, and most of the regulations are actually based on the GHTF regulations, which is in turn the classification is based on the MBD directive. So uh, the key thing is one needs to note that if you have a already classified this device in the, under the MBD directive, you would be close to saying that you know you don't have to perform another reclassification in Singapore, and HSA does not perform any classification on behalf of the company, and the company needs to provide the justification to the health license authority on why they decide to choose this certain risk classification. We're going to go through in terms of um, what are these classifications about, and in in the EU regulation, it talks about class 1, class 2A, 2B, and class 3. In Singapore, it's just A, B, C, D. And most of this uh, classifications, if you already, as I mentioned, if you classify it prior to Singapore, you can use the same classification and that shouldn't be a problem. Okay? So as, um, as seen in this diagram itself, the higher the risk classification, the more technical requirements and documents you would need to provide to HSA in order to provide the justification for registration. Now let's uh, talk about the product registration routes in Singapore itself. So currently, as I mentioned, Class A itself, there are two main routes that go through the registration process, which is the exempted route and the notification route. The exempted route is basically a route where HSA has uh, listed um, devices uh, under the guidance 22. It talks about devices that are not that do not require any registration with the HSA. This list um, can include anything from um, scrubs and, and uh, ankle supports and such. The key thing to note here is that this list is a is not a static list. It can be found on the HSA website, but this list is not a static list. And the key thing that needs to that needs to meet exactly is that the specific description and the intended purpose needs to match exactly on the guidance document itself. If anything is uh, different or slightly different, HSA has the right to to classify it otherwise. And in which this case here, it can be either a class A still or move forward to a B, C, or D. But most of the time, it will still not jump too many classes up to class D. So this exempted list, one of the examples I can provide is in terms of surgical masks. When this list was initially um, made, surgical masks was uh, under the exempted list, but because of the SARS crisis in, in, in the world, this surgical mask has uh, been regarded as something that's of a, that needs to be registered in Singapore. So they moved it to a, a notification process itself. Okay, so what is this notification process in in terms of the, unlike the class B, C, and D, all class A devices that go through the notification will not be screened for its um, claims, but it's more important for them, for HSA, to look out for in terms of whether or not the devices can be actually classified as a class A product. So the documents that's needed to be submitted, the HSA would definitely look at your labeling and your brochures to see whether the claims that you make uh, would fit the classification. And if, if they feel that it's not, um, doesn't meet the classification, they would then let you know that you need to submit it under a different classification. So what they look, will look out for is specifically on your classification rather than your claims and your performance, your evidence for the performance and claims. Yeah, Mr. Koh, right. I think we need to pick it up a little. Okay. Uh, class B, C, and D, um, here we'll talk about the abridged and full submission route. The abridged submission here, Basically, if you have a registration in either the US, EU, Canada, or one of the GHTF countries, you are able to go through the abridged route itself. And and this route basically means that you will be able to, the time for this route will be shorter and the cost will be shorter. At the same time, the documents that you submit will not be required in so much detail. For the full submission route, would basically mean that the HSC will evaluate everything from scratch. And the documents that you submit would be um, subject to what HSA actually requires, okay? I'm just going to move on to the next slide here. 
this uh, phases of implementation, uh, I'll go through in detail in the next couple of slides. So let's just go through the the more important ones would actually be in 2010. So phase one here, uh, AIMS Day will be having these slides, right? They'll be able to receive these slides. AIMS, would they be able to get these slides? If they are able to get these slides, I'm just going to move on to the 2010 here itself. So for the various phases itself, phase one and two have already passed, so I'm not going to spend time talking about that. But let's focus on what's going to happen in phase 3A. Okay, in phase 3A here, this is in August 2010, all the class C and D medical devices have to be registered. So if you have a class C and D device, this is something that needs to be uh, registered in Singapore before the supply can be made. All right. In phase 3B here, which is the key phase uh, that's coming up right up in January, all class A and B devices, if they are not being registered with the HSA, will not be authorized to be imported or supplied in, in Singapore. And, and, and basically with the start of this phase, it basically means that the whole uh, A, B, C, D devices would have to be registered prior to uh, supply. Okay. So to be in full compliance with the uh, Class A and B regulations itself, let me just go to specifically on the Class uh, A and B regulations. Looking at, uh, first of all, looking at the November 30th, 2011 date, this is really the date that one needs to take note of, which is basically in two months' time. Um, in order to ensure that your supply of your Class A B uh, devices are uh, can continually be supplied in Singapore after 2011, that means as of 1st of January. One needs to ensure that your products are actually submitted to HSA prior to the 30th of November. What happens is, as, I, as you can see, there's this word transition list, and I mentioned this earlier, is that the transition list, the main purpose of the transition list is to ensure that products in that have not been registered or and approved in Singapore will still be able to be supplied. I'll give you an example. Basically, if you have a product that is being registered prior to this date and, and come January 1st, 2012, it's not being approved in HSA yet. But because you have submitted prior to November 30th, HSA would put this product on the transition list, provided it is not being rejected or for other reasons. And once it's on this transition list, you can continue to supply and, and import these products into Singapore for sale. And you will, all, you will continue on this list until such a point in time when HSA has made a decision that the product is approved or it has rejected the product. Okay? So this, uh, and, and the other criteria for it being on the transition list is that it must qualify for the average evaluation, which I also mentioned earlier, it needs to be uh, being approved in one of the GHTF countries prior to this. Okay? Yeah, Calvin, I think we really got to pick it up here, buddy. Okay. Yep. Um, this this couple of slides are probably important. So, after November 30th, if you are not already registered, then you just have to wait for the product to be registered before it's being sold in Singapore. Okay? So, currently, all Class A and B products can still be sold in Singapore until the without a license, without being registered, until December 31st, 2011. That's the main thing. Okay. So, so let's. I've mentioned this slide also. And come January 1st, uh, 2012, if it's not in the transition list, it needs to be registered prior for sale. Okay. I'm trying to move the slides forward. Okay. Um, Class C and D, as I as, as I mentioned. At all, as of this point in time, all the Class C and D devices need to be registered before and approved before it can be sold in Singapore. So what would you do right now if you don't have um, any of the products that's uh, being registered? Um, let me just touch on the Class A products first on this. Um, as I mentioned the notification earlier, you can see from this slide, the main regulatory decision that they are trying to make is to verify that the risk causation and product claim meet the Class A registration. That's basically the notification process here. Okay, and the decision will be made uh, from HSA to let you know that. Okay, the abridged submission here, as I said, uh, these are the five countries that need to take note of. I'd like to point out that one needs to 
the HSA would require the company who is submit, submitting to the abridged submission to decide on one country of choice. That means if you have an, an approval in Australia, Canada, and the U.S., you need to decide which of the countries you want to base the abridged submission on. And when you base the abridged submission on, you need to ensure that the packaging, labeling, IFUs, uh, intended use are the same as the country of choice that you're submitting for. That means both, if they are not the same, you they would need you to choose the one that you want to submit. Okay, so this is something that's important when you make a decision on on which um, country of choice that you're making. Okay, if you do not have any of this data itself, the full evaluation process would mean that the HSA would be your first company that uh, first uh, authority that reviews the documents. Most companies do not actually go through this full evaluation because one needs to, to know that HSA is, is a pretty young uh, regulatory authority itself, unlike the, H, uh, the FDA, which has many years of experience. So if you have a Class C or D product, it's my advice that you would try to get your you know, C mark or a 510K clearance prior to submitting to HSA, all right? So let me go on to the next slide. Okay, the format and registration that needs to be provided here, I, I've listed two items in green, which is the pre-submission consultation and the submission of device stores here itself. Um, HSA does uh, allow for pre-submission consultations with them if you require, if you're not sure how to classify it. But um, based on the current workload, because they are trying to clear up a lot of the class A and B documents, these pre-submission consultants has actually um, been stopped at this point in time. So they are not able to, to meet up with the consultation itself and they will most probably ask you to look at the frequently asked questions that's available on their website. Um, so this, this is some, something to take note of. If you have a complicated device, it's still advisable to still try and write and see whether they will be able to accommodate that request. Okay. The submission of the dossier itself is, is through the medic system. So um, even it, it, it's key that you get the whole um, administrative setup done for the registrant through the quiz account prior to getting any of the submission being done. Okay. All right. Um, the evaluation decision and the regulatory decision, HSA would have um, allow for several input requests on the documents, and they are usually quite... Um, generous in terms of the amount of input requests as long as you keep providing the, the uh, answers to the questions that they have and and provide them the the necessary documents, documents that they ask, ask for. So it's important to know that there's also a time frame that they would usually set in terms of documents that they will require to enable them to make a decision. Okay, each, each time when they have an input request, they usually have a deadline that's set on the system itself and you need to provide the answers before those deadlines. If not, the application be closed. Okay. The the whole dossier submission and preparation follow the ASEAN CSDT format, which is roughly that follows the JSTF format for submission itself. And the whole idea is that they want to tr in ASEAN itself they want to try to have this format that we can be submitted among the ASEAN countries itself. The status of this right now is um, Singapore and Malaysia are following the, the CSDT format, but most of the rest of the countries are only starting to manage this process itself. The hope is in 2015 they would have a common medical uh, directive that would be able to bind all these countries and ASEAN together. But at, as of this point in time, only Singapore is actively using this CSDT format itself. So very briefly, the requirements here, if, if you have your CSDT in English and if it really follows the technical dossier format in, in the EU, you probably have close to 90% of the necessary documents itself uh, that, need, that needs to be submitted in. Okay. Very, it's, it's important that the, there's uniformity and consistency in all the documents that you provide for in terms of especially of the intended users, the indications for use. and, and Documents such as the, for example, the biocompatibility studies and stuff like that need to refer specifically to your products and the necessary code that you have on it. All right. 
the other thing that needs to be taken note of, uh, unlike the rest of uh, that you need to additionally prepare is also an executive summary and a device description that would uh, basically summarize all the information that you have in your whole technical dossier into the format that's required by the CSDT itself. Okay, some of the examples are being listed here. Some of the things that's required is being listed there. Okay, so I've, I've talked about briefly what needs to be done in terms of the submission procedure here, so let me just move on to the next slide. The annual renewal of the product registration is also done online, and HSA would provide a renewal notice to the registrant about 30 days before the ex license expires. At this point in time, you basically need to go into the system and also provide any changes if you have to the products and make a declaration on the system itself and pay the necessary fees and, and the product gets registered. So you do not need to submit any new technical um, information for this provided that all the intended users and the indications for use are the same. And if you have any uh, changes to the document and, and technical claims, then you need to go through this process known as the change notification. Okay, so that the changes that are uh, being required to do, uh, then for example, let me repeat that again. Changes that need to be notified to the HSA include technical changes and administrative changes. So you have things like change of a uh, dealer, change of the administration, the product name. You can go through uh, the notification and, and basically you just need to make a declaration on the system. Other changes that involve critically the indications for use and the intended use, you need to back those uh, changes with the necessary data itself, clinical data and the preclinical data, depending on the type of changes that's required. Okay. So if if there are changes that are really that are really significant and um, different from your product itself, HSA may decide that this may also be a new product registration itself. So basically if if you have a a very key change to the, the indications for use and one needs to um, be aware that there is a possibility that the change notification may not be suitable. Okay. Moving on to the next slide itself. Um, one of the time frames for medical device product registration is something that is a question that's often asked, but there are turnaround times that HSA has set itself to do, but these turnaround times are usually not met at this point in time because of the great influx of uh, registrations that um, that it's currently experiencing. So for especially for Class A and B, right now, uh, because of the 30th of November deadline, HSA is spending a lot of its resources on, on trying to clear those registrations and making sure that they can make onto the transition list. So if you are only doing any registrations right now, you observe that, you know, the Class C and D uh, review process may have slowed down quite a bit, while the Class A and B would, would be the ones that they are looking into registering. So this would take some time to stabilize and we expect that once the whole bulk of the class A and B uh, registrations are in the system itself, we will start getting a bit more stable registration processes itself. In the past, um, just briefly on some of the timelines, the class C and Ds may take up to a year depending on the type of information that you have. And usually during a year itself, there are some documents that would have expired also. So uh, there will be a case where you need to supply documents that um, have expired with the new ones. For example, I'll give you an example is the uh, T confirm, uh, the 1345 certificates. So th these are usually have an annual renewal, so they want to make sure that your dates are up to date. All right? So the fees itself, uh, let me just go to the next slide that will talk about the fee stream. Uh, the class B, C, and Ds have an application fee which you pay first in terms of getting it on the system. And after the evaluation, the evaluation fees will be paid once the product has been completed its evaluation cycle. As I mentioned, the full and the bridge evaluation have quite a difference in the prices itself, so uh, this is something to take note of. And and the the fee structure for the annual re retention is uh, it's pretty small, and it's a pretty nominal fee that you need to pay. 
Okay. If you do not have a registration approved, this is uh, another uh, initiative that the HSA has uh, brought about, which is known as the authorization route to help you bring in products into Singapore on a short-term basis itself. So primarily, th this is uh, due to the industry response that the, the registration times are too long and, and this would cause the supply of the products to be um, halted in Singapore. So there are, there are basically six primary routes that you can bring in the product into Singapore, but not all the routes you are able to supply. This is where I will make the distinction between importation and supply. The authorization routes basically allow you to import the devices to Singapore, but not all the authorization routes allow you to supply into Singapore. And if you could look at the very last one that talks about the authorization route for import for consignment basis, you basically can bring in the product, but you cannot supply it in. And these, these are cases here for uh, companies who, who think that they're going to get that soon. So this would help to shorten down the whole supply chain. But this would not be the route that would be most utilized if you intend to supply for the product itself. Um, there are some things that are from like the supply on the name patient basis, as, as, is, as is being mentioned. It needs to be specifically for a patient. If you have a, things like a custom device and stuff like that, it needs to be made, meant for one patient only. Okay. For the authorization route for supply on request of the licensed facility, this is where you need to get the authorization from the hospitals uh, in Singapore that are being licensed under this Act to give you the exemption to to bring in these products. Along along with the rest of them, if you have any uh, products that you need to bring in for an exhibition and you're not actually using it for a medical purpose, the choice of the authorization would be for the supply of non-clinical purpose itself. Do note that after you bring in for this route itself, so after you, you know, are allowed to bring in the product, you need to bring out the product also after the conference or the meeting is over. Okay. The, and the, this can be seen as a loophole in the sense that people might try to bring in products through this route, but Haitians A has also warned that these routes are specifically for a short-term basis and you such a point when you get your actual license for the product itself. So let's say if you're going for the PHMC license itself, the, that's the second point. You can do it once, twice, but if you do it all the time continuously, it's, they would start to ask you, why don't you just register the product itself? So this is uh, something that HSA would look at the industry to, you know, not abuse the system that's being provided. Okay. The addition. So let's talk about uh, the additional requirements after you you got the product registered. What's next? So in order to bring in the product itself. You still need other licenses, which is the importers and the wholesalers license. Uh, the main activities here is um, involved in is um, the licenses that you need to take note of would be the importers license and the wholesalers license itself. The importers license would need and the wholesalers license are to be held by a Singapore registered company. And this can be anyone from your distributor or your local company itself. So who needs a Singapore license itself? Um, as, as you can see from this chart itself, all the the main thing is that local companies need the local uh, the Singapore license. Any overseas manufacturers itself do not need to be licensed by the HSA. I give uh, just very briefly on this document itself. The local hospital. The ones in blue, the local hospital overseas manufacturer, do not need any license to handle the product itself. One exception is if the local hospital decides to be the importer and wholesaler of a specific device, then the local hospital will need to have an importer's license. But usually, this is done through a distributor itself. Um, if you have a drop ship through a third party logistics, um, uh, the the third party logistic company does not require a actual medical device quality um quality uh, systems certification it actually just needs a license a gdpm ds license i would explain more on the gdpm ds in a later slide okay so the main thing about this third party logistic company in which a distributor needs to do is to ensure that the the third party logistic company that helps you hold the product itself 
is being audited on. Um, and that's one of the key roles of the license holder itself. Let me go through this slide because this one involves a local... Let me skip this slide because it goes through with a local manufacturer, which I believe will not influence the people in the audience right now. Okay, this slide also. On this slide, it's trying to load up. Okay, um, again here, what the HSA would require in terms of fees is can be seen. It's these fees are also meant to be renewed yearly, annually, and the annual uh, renewal of these fees are also the same price as you can see. As I said then, earlier, this GDPM, this which is the good distribution practice for medical devices, one of the requirements to for the Registering to get the necessary licenses is that the company needs to be certified to the GDPMDS standard in Singapore. This is something that's unique in Singapore in the sense that, that the government recognizes that not all companies do manufacturing in Singapore, but there's still a need to control the supply and the, the distribution of the goods. So this, in, in summary, this um, requirement is actually taken from the 13485, uh, ISO 13485, uh, requirements itself, excluding the sections on the the device, uh, the manufacturing aspect, as well as the, the dossier aspect of the 13485. So it really covers all the uh, supply and distribution, technical support, uh, distribution records, internal audits, and management reviews. Okay, um, talking about adverse events here, it's critical to know that the adverse events are really one of the first things that HSA has put in place uh, since 2007. And, and if you have any adverse events, be it um, whether or not you are doing clinical trials or having it through the authorization, you need to provide them, the HSA, with uh, any notifications of adverse events. The definition of adverse events can be found here, and, and one can follow closely to the MDD directives to, in order to understand this better, okay? Most in, uh, the key thing is to always keep HSA connected and in touch with any adverse events that you find ha that might happen. Okay. Same as the uh, field safety corrective action. Once the adverse event has been reported, it's it's necessary to ensure that the HSA is also informed uh, prior to initiating any FSCA. If um, if H if you have decided that the risk is unacceptable. Okay. The other aspects of post-market handling would be also be complaint handling itself. Um, it's critical that one needs to ensure that all complaints are managed in a systematic and logical order, and the rationale for complaints not escalating to any adverse events should be maintained also in case the uh, regulatory authorities need to review this document. Okay, And distribution records, I think this one here is something that uh, it's one of the things that HSA has also stressed on in terms of making sure that all products that are brought in and out of Singapore are accounted for. And giving an example here is taking that if you have products that are using Singapore as a transshipment hub, that means you bring in products into Singapore, you don't sell it in Singapore, but you need to send it out of Singapore. HSA would require that these records be kept properly because annually this license for import for export has to be uh, provided for Singapore to the HSA at the end of each year when you want to renew the license, the import for export authorization rules. Okay, this is one key point. Moving on to advertising and promotions itself, very basic is that you should not advertise any product if if it's um, as a health product if it's not a health product. So you should not make any claims for it and and any products in such a way that it exaggerates the claims of and the indications for use. So nothing that's well and fanciful, but really keep directly to the medical uh, nature of the product itself. Okay, let me just move on to this, this slide here. I think the, the key thing that you need to take note of that there are penalties that are involved. Currently, um, there isn't it 
any big finds in the news so far, but it's key to note that, you know, anything that goes wrong, Singapore is uh, otherwise known as a fine country, and, and there's always that um, hanging behind that if, if you don't do it properly, you might get fined or even put to jail. So this is something to take note of. Trying to move to the next slide, so not showing up yet. Yeah, Mr. Ko, it's on the screen for the attendees, I think. Oh, okay. So you can go um, back one slide about the reimbursement. Okay. Uh, is it still on? Because I, I really can't see it. Sorry. It's fine. Okay, so I think we are in the reimbursement. This is, you're, you're seeing the reimbursement slide right now? Yes. Okay. So as I said, there is currently no scheme for reimbursement of products, and there are uh, no plans in the future, but currently health policy is something that is being studied and and right now to see what would be what would help in, in terms of this reimbursement. Most Singaporeans um any have a thing called the Medisafe which actually helps to pay for certain of the um medical expenditure, including surgery and some of the the, the devices itself. But this one is really on it's not um uh, something that is structured in terms of what codes can be uh, reimbursed and, and what codes cannot be. So as I said, uh, this is something that might take place in the future. Yeah, uh, okay. Mr. Ko, can you explain a little about the Medisafe program? Okay, uh, um, the Medisafe pro program is basically a part of the salary that uh, Singapore employees have. Uh, it's being uh, being taken out for this thing called the Central Provident Fund, which is known as a CPF for short. And some of the fees is being put into different accounts, and one of these accounts is the Medisafe account which basically helps to pay for, that you can utilize these fees to pay for your medical expenditure in the, uh, when you use it in terms of um, uh, inside the hospitals and stuff. For example, like your ward admission fees, some of the surgery fees itself. So this is one thing that the government tries to do to ensure that the population has sufficient to pay for the ex uh, medical expenditure. Okay. And I'm just going to go on to the last. I still cannot see anything on my slide, so I'm hoping that you guys are still with me at the... Yeah, we are. This is probably the last, uh, one of the last few slides, which is the future tra trend. Um, as I mentioned, the HSA regulations are, are pretty new, 2007, so they are subject to tweaking and changes in the upcoming years. And what one thing that really would be stable is trying to ensure that the supply of medical devices, that's really one of the objectives, the supply of medical devices are not being hindered, as well as uh, balance off with the safety of the devices itself. So once, um, and this is, Singapore really takes the medical device regulation in light of a global um, impact. So currently it follows really closely with GHTF. So if there are changes to, uh, I mean, there are current changes to GHTF and, and the future ahead, you know, with would also depend on looking at the global regulatory climate. One thing we, we would like to I'd like to emphasize is that um, there is very just and fair ways of trying to, to review the documents and and most of the regulators, if you are able to provide anything that's scientifically feasible and that makes sense, they would usually be able to follow that too. Okay? And medical device companies are also advised to continue to check for the updates. And as I said, in this phase between now, the year from November and 2012, we expect um, HSA to always be close in, in letting uh, the companies and industry know of any changes there are. One, lastly, the change notification procedures and clinical trial requirements will be something that will be the next phase of um, being formalized and being implemented. Clinical trials especially, if you're intending to perform any clinical trials in Singapore, this will be something to take note of in the next one or two years. Uh, the, the clinical trials branch has actually currently released uh, several, um, I won't call it guidances, but have, have had a briefing with industry on what they intend to implement in the next year or so. And, and one needs to, this will be definitely updated um, accordingly in the next uh, couple of months' time. I think for future trends, I, I think there was a question regarding to what are the timelines that's expected. For most of the class A and B products, because they have not been um, 
none of them been approved because they're still under the transition list yet. Uh, we really do not have any idea how long this will take. Uh, we are hoping that the industry is really hoping that this will not take as long as the class C and D devices in terms of the fact that the technical dossiers are usually simpler and, and this would be a case where hopefully it will be a shorter than uh, what's been being currently experienced. As I mentioned, the class C and Ds can take from 9 months to 12 months and, and it's being advised to the industry that if you get an input request from patients A, it's best to submit as early as possible so that you know you shorten this time that's needed for the whole registration itself. So it's best to do the submission right the first time round than to spend time you know, uh, going through the various cycles of uh, questions and answers with the HSA. So Mr. Ko, I think that will conclude your formal uh, remarks on the webcast today. Thank you very much, Mr. Ko, for staying up so late in Singapore to give this presentation. And we apologize for the technical difficulties with the voice. Uh, Singapore is known as a real hub for telecommunications, but somehow there was a disconnection uh, with the call to Singapore. So uh, please take a sip of water, Mr. Ko, and we already have about 20 questions that I'd like to go over with you. And attendees, uh, please uh, send in your questions through the... Um, uh, chat feature on the, on the screen, and attendees, please also uh, fill out the evaluation forms at the end of the webcast, which we sent to you. Now, the first question we have is: Are electronic health record systems considered medical devices under Singapore's Health Products Act of 2007 and the 2010 implementing implementing regulations, such that sellers of such software must register otherwise comply? So basically, are, health, are electronic health records considered medical devices in Singapore today? Um, yes. Um, if you can't, I, mean, I think one of the first questions you will ask is, are you re being registered in the EU? If, if you have been as a medical device, it's, it's close that you will be a medical device in Singapore also. I think here we, we should look at the various risk classification rules that's being provided in the, the guidance documents to go through. Um, that will be, I would say, the first thing that you would take note of. And let me, I'm trying to, to, to go through the, the, the rules itself. Um, this would probably be a Class A device due to the fact that it, the, they would not, a class, a class A device and also would be an active device itself. And, and due to the fact that there is, um, the risk classification would probably be lower because this is really a record coding, but so I'll, I would say that this would probably be a class A device. Okay, great. Next question. How long do class A and class B device registrations take on average? How long do class A and class B device registrations take on average? Um, as I mentioned, currently the registration approvals are not really in place yet because they are trying to get the transition list in order. So we will probably start to see the approvals in in the next couple of months time. So right now there really isn't any answer but as I mentioned, because of the fact that the technical dossiers are less, they will not take as long as the class C and D's. Okay, great. Yeah. Next question. Will a company have to register using both the Singapore system and the ASEAN uh C S D T format? Will a company have to register using both the Singapore system and the ASEAN CSDT format? Currently, the registrations for Singapore would follow the ASEAN CSDT. So if you arrange it according to the guidance document that's being provided, you can submit into Singapore. Um, and as I mentioned, in ASEAN itself, currently there are no um, countries that are really accepting this format as of yet, besides Singapore and, and Malaysia also. Uh, so if you can get this in this format, it's hoped and, ex and by the industry that the rest of the ASEAN um, uh, countries will also be able to follow the format that, that you have used in Singapore. However, this is not, uh, as I said, this is not being um, cast in stone yet, and this is, uh, we are really waiting for 2015 to, to hear more from them. Okay, we have another question here. Um what kinds of sales activities can a company engage in prior to approval? And they present the device at a conference. So I think we talked about this. What kind of 
sales activities can a company engage in prior to approval? Can they present the device at a conference? Yes, you can present the device at a conference. If you need to bring samples of the device in, that's when you use an authorization to bring the device in. Um, you can, of course, speak. At the end of the day, the key point importation and supply. You can, of course, speak to the customers, and but the, the key point is to say that if it's not registered, you can't bring it and you can't sell to them. Uh, if if you want to bring it in for show and tell, that can be done through the authorization route. But if you want to sell it to them, you still need the license. So you can talk to them, you can go to the hospitals, and you need to do like clinical trials. This would be going under the clinical trials route. And you need to make demonstrations into a patient. That's different. You can't do that because that's considered as a supply unless you go through the one of the authorization routes, which I think I mentioned either on a name patient basis or when the hospital... Uh, allows you to do so through the PHMC license. So the key thing is, if you want to put into the patient, use it on the patient, you can't do that until you get the approval. Okay, great. Next question. Is registration of a device manufactured by the HSA necessary? If a medical device is manufactured but not sold in Singapore, is registration of a device manufacturer so basically, do you have to register the device manufactured by the SSA, HSA necessary if a medical device is manufactured but not sold in Singapore? So I guess this would apply to local manufacturing in Singapore. Right. So um, what's given is definitely you need the manufacturer's license. So that's key. If you're not supplying into Singapore, you don't have to register in HSA itself. The key thing is that the manufacturer's license gives you the permission to manufacture as well as supply that means export out of Singapore. But any time that you choose to use it in Singapore, you then need a license. But if you're not supplying in Singapore, you don't have to have the product registration done. Great. Next question. You mentioned that in the second quarter of 2011, all medical devices will need to be registered. Does this also include in vitro diagnostics? Yep. Um, I not mentioned about intro, in vitro IV devices here, but... IV devices are also part of the medical device regulation. So this would also be include the IV devices. And I would briefly say that the IV um, classification is also following the ABCD class, where the A being the lowest risk and D being the highest risk. The, um, this follows close to the Canadian system of classification. Great. Next question is, when there is an adverse event occurring in another country, does the adverse event that occurred in the other country need to be reported in Singapore also? Um, the adverse event does not need to be reported, but however, if you have lots and, and certain lots in this country, that means if the event affects a certain lot that also has uh, you have product in Singapore itself, you might have to do a fuel safety corrective action. So this you still need to inform HSA, if that actually happens, because if you need to bring it back or recall it back, it's important to take note. Okay, next question. Um, is the register in Singapore a publicly accessible database? Yeah, the Singapore Medical Device Register, or the SMDR, is uh, accessible in the HSA website, and this will be con constantly updated. Um, in terms of whether is it real-time, uh, not. I don't think it's actually real-time. But you'll be consistent. Uh, to be uh, at least updated on a frequent basis. You can search it by product owner, name, registrant, and even including the intended use itself. Okay. Next question: For the abridged submissions, do we still need to submit a CSDT? Yes, you still need to do that. Okay. For the abridged submissions, right? Right. Right. Okay. Next question: Does a Singapore manufacturer uh, need to be ISO 13485 certified if its products are for export only? Uh, yes. One of the requirements for the manufacturing license is to have a valid 13485 certificate with the appropriate scope for the devices that you're manufacturing. Okay. Next question. Where can we get information regarding classification of devices? Is there a, transi a separate transition period and classification document for IVDs? Uh, Where can we get information regarding classification of devices? 
Is there a separate transition period and a separate classification uh, documents required for IVDs? Okay, um, the guidance document that you would want to look at is all the okay. All the guidance documents can be found on the HSA website, and the specific one that you're looking for for the IVD is uh, GN14, which talks about the risk classification. Um, no, the, the transition period is, is the same. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, next question: How long does it take to obtain the GDP MDS certificate? How long does it take to obtain the GDP MDS certificate? This would depend on the size and the operations that's being performed in the company itself. So, if you have a you know a distributor that's only about a ten person setup and he doesn't deal with a lot of logistics itself, it could be quite a fast process. The key thing, I mean, with any of the it's that it needs to be tailored for the organization. So you don't have to have, you know, complicated procedures, you know, electronic records and stuff like that. You can even work with a pen and pencil just to make sure that the records are in place. So if you have experience, you can take anything from three months, uh, you know, to much longer when you need to set up the infrastructure for a year. Um, Mr. Ko, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Okay. We had a little static on the line. Okay, the next question. Is product registration linked to the tendering process in Singapore? Where can we get information regarding government tenders? Um, I'm afraid for tenders, I'm not too sure where to get that information from. But yes, most of the tender requirements will require that the product is registered prior to supply. So, yep. Okay. With regard to reimbursement into in Singapore, uh, you mentioned briefly about the MediSafe program. So this is a contribution by the employer and the employee to the MediSafe program? That's right. Uh, the employer and the employee would contribute a certain percentage of the of his pay into the MediSafe program itself. So now would the MediSafe program uh, differentiate between uh, about using that money for drugs, devices, procedures? Um, the, the whole list is actually... That specifically speaking, it's mainly for the a lot of um, the stays in the hospitals by um, different class of, of wards, and, and the percentage is also dealing with the fact of um, what treatment that you want to do. Um, I think all this is um, it's not available on the HSA website. Yep. So, but the key thing is that they are given a certain percentage of of what they can spend on and. And once your amount runs dry, you don't have any more reimbursement for the the type of um, hospitalization that you are, that you will have to do. So this is really specific to the individual itself, and it's not the moment that your funds have run dry in the med MediSafe, you need to come up with the real cash for the payment. Okay, so there's a lot of self-pay after the MediSafe runs out. Right, that's right. Okay, next question. Is there a list of requirements for abridged submissions? Is there a list of requirements for abridged submissions? Yes, um, the product registration itself, uh, the, the guidance document, this will be guidance document number 15. We'll talk about um, what's required and the various um, uh, routes, which include the full and the abridged routes. And if you need to put them in the correct format, then the right one would also, the other guidance document that you want to look into would be the guidance document for the CSDT itself. Okay, okay. great. Um, next question. Um, what is required to import a medical device into Singapore from the United States now? What is required to import a device into Singapore from the U.S. now? For the if you have a device that specifically comes from the U.S., there are certain things that uh, you definitely need to do. Is first of all arrange it into the GSDT format for submission because that's the only uh, format that the HSA will accept. At the same time, things like uh, essential principles, which is something that the EU uh, submissions will be more familiar with, need to also be written up. So um, getting that into the format would be I would think it would be the additional work that needs to be done. Key thing is, um, it's really a, a case of being able to arrange it to the right uh, sections in the document. And if you have a 
a well-established uh, device history file, uh, this could probably be well, uh, this shouldn't take too much of a time. Right, I mean, the, the main thing is that they have to have a, their own subsidiary company uh, or distributor or an independent third party acting as the agent in Singapore too to get the product in from the U.S., right? Right, that's right. I mean, um, you need to have someone locally to still uh, submit on behalf of you if you don't have any, uh, you know, subsidiaries or branch in Singapore. Yeah. Right, and so um, so that the, the dossier could be submitted by the distributor, by a company subsidiary office, or by independent third party. That's right. Okay. Uh, next question: Is there a way for a local doctor in Singapore? to take responsibility for the import and commercial use of a medical product. Is there a way for a local doctor in Singapore to take responsibility for the import and commercial use of a medical product? I assume that's a non-registered medical product. Would that be correct? That's right. I would think that would mean that. And that's why they have the route for the name patient basis itself. So, uh, and the PHMT Act where the hospital can bring it in. So there is that element of responsibility in terms of, of bringing in the product itself. So that's the import of non-registered products by an individual Singaporean doctor, right? Yes. Um, and, and I need to stress that, you know, the responsibility is still a shared responsibility because they need to, you still need to, even though it's being brought in by the doctor and he has requested for it, the person that still actually ultimately brings it in would still be the product owner in terms of the safety and the performance of the device. Okay, would that be the doctor in that case? Um, I think, as I said, it's a shared responsibility here because it's the person who does the authorization would still be the product owner itself. Okay. The next question. Does the product owner have to be ISO 13485 uh, 2003 certified if they are not the actual device manufacturer? So does the product owner have to be ISO 13485 2003 certified if they are not the actual device manufacturer. One of the documents that's needed when you are submitting the, the whole registration documents is that they would need a valid 13485 certificate or for, for the U.S. companies, if you don't have a 13485 license, would be uh, the EIR to, to provide evidence of the audit being performed. So, um, if you don't have a valid 13485, you need to at least provide that um, certificate of your, you know, contract manufacturer that this is actually being man uh, manufactured there. So that's actually key. Okay. Next question. Um, is a letter of authorization mandatory for ASEAN or is a letter of authorization mandatory for Singapore? Uh, for Singapore, yes, it is an uh, it is uh, compulsory that you need to do it. For ASEAN itself, currently there is no uh, um, written any regulations on that. Okay. Uh, the next question. Is the annual renewal a full resubmission of the dossier? Is the annual renewal a full resubmission of the dossier, or I guess is it something else? Uh, no, you don't have to do it. Uh, only if you forget to renew and it's being delayed and your product is taken out of the product register, then you need to resubmit everything again. So it's just basically a paper exercise. So what do you recommend companies do for re-registration re of the product? Um, the whole thing is uh, to ensure that your distributor submits all the necessary documents online. That, that's, uh, you know, keep note, basic documentation procedures need to be in place and make sure that you renew it. HSA does send renewal notices, so, you know, do it earlier than later. Okay, the next question is, um, I'm not sure what this means, but is there a list of the CAB accredited by the SAC? Is there a, a list of the CAB accredited by the SAC? Can you go into those okay. definitions too, Mr. Okay, Ko? The, the conformity assessment bodies are the the list of um it's something like a notified body in the EU where they are given the, the authority to, to perform the necessary uh GDPMDS audits on in in Singapore itself and this is being 
accredited by the, the Singapore Accreditation Council. So there is a list on the SAC website. I'm not sure what that website is, but if you just Google, you'll be able to find it out quite easily. So um, current CABs would include uh, TUFSUD, um, SGS, amongst others. Right. Okay, the next question is, why do the Singaporean regulations follow closer to Europe than the U.S.? Okay, um, interestingly, the whole thing is because they actually follow the GHTF regulations more closely, and and the GHTF regulations, most of it seems to be based on the MDD directive itself. Hence, it takes, a in a way, a, a, bias, a bias towards the European regulation. But the the whole motivation and principle is really trying to follow a global uh, regulatory uh, framework. Okay. The next question is, if you're registering a product in Singapore and you're having some issues with the HSA, how do you recommend we reconcile those issues? Should we send them an email? Should we send a company representative to meet with the HSA? What would you recommend? Okay, um, most instances, uh, the input request would be the best way to get the information through because it's on the system itself. Uh, the, most the HSA doesn't give off the personal emails of the the reviewers itself, and you don't really know who the reviewer is. So sending them an email is often a shot in the dark. Uh, making phone calls to them is also often difficult because uh, you know you usually might not be able to get through the line. At the same time, they are also not willing to expose the regulators off to to the question specific to them because they do not want a case where. You know, when you speak to the regulator online, then you speak to another regulator, and you take one word for another, and this would create a lot of uh, messy issues. So the HSA itself would uh, prefer if you just answer straight to the input request, and if it has gone on for some time, it, it, you could drop an email or uh, drop the questions that you need on the on the input request and put, provide contact numbers, and they would uh, sometimes respond to, to those numbers to you. So you would say, in general, it's not appropriate for the yep. foreign medical device manufacturer to set up a meeting with HSA. Um, I, I wouldn't. I would not say it's not appropriate, but it's very hard to get a meeting approved, and and usually a phone call would be the first thing they try to do because they are really overloaded with a lot of uh, submissions that they need to clear through. Okay. The next question is: We know when we know when we're registering several medical devices in the other Asian markets. Who you know is often just as important as what you put on the paper. Is this the case in Singapore too? Um, no, I, I, as I said, the uh, putting the regulators behind a blind so they don't want to expose the person who, who registers it. Um, I, I would say it's important to know who the regulators are, but I don't think the whole point is is uh, based on a how well you know the regulators to get it cleared. It okay, the next question is not, yeah. Okay, the next question would be how do you compare the Singapore culture to the other Asian markets and also to the cultures in the West? I would say that um everything is there's a term it's called black and white. So everything needs to be on a, a paper document and, and clearly defined. And everything needs to be done according to the law. So if it's not done according to the law, then um it will not be accepted in, in Singapore. So that means that there's really no corruption involved and everything needs to be a, a clear indication, although the interpretation of the law might change over time, but if, if everything is still on a very clean and clear, transparent process itself. I, I don't think it's appropriate to comment on other Asian countries, but I think um, with a system in place, the the rest of the Asian countries, would be it will be easier to do the submission in those countries. Yep. Um, in terms of the Western culture itself, I would say that most of the Asian countries, in terms of the, are usually a step back for registration because most people will adopt a strategy of trying to clear the EU and the US regulations prior to getting into the Asian markets only because the FDA uh, appearances and the C mark are often viewed as a, a, a gold standard in terms of uh, registration. HSA has maintained that um, you know, the whole getting approval in those countries 
do not translate into automatic approvals or guaranteed approvals because they still want to ensure that their system is put in place. Okay, the next question is, can you give us any insight on to the local clinical trial requirements in Singapore in the future? Um, local clinical trial requirements itself, what we are looking at really in terms of the clinical requirements is that they are trying to follow with the GHTF, and this is the ISO 14155 uh, regulations and standards. So this, one thing for sure is that if you have done a clinical trial or you intend to do a clinical trial, this has to be done according to these standards. Um, everything would still uh, be falling according to the health products regulations. Um, there are definitions for um, trying to set up the, the adverse events reporting also. As I mentioned, this is a key thing here. Currently, all the clinical trial requirements still follow the Medicines Act. So um, it, it follows those requirements here. But in the future, once it's being in place and the guidances are out, we will look at really following the, the specific one for medical device, which is the, the standards, which is the ISO 14155. So things like putting in monitors, putting in the, the um, clinical trial coordinators are all essential. Well, as a follow-up question, the... Um person is asking, how likely will the HSA accept foreign clinical data as opposed to local clinical data? Um, there is no requirement for local clinical data uh, from the HSA explicitly. However, if you have an indication that just only covers for Singaporeans, then of course a local trial is needed. But the, the, the whole point is um, clinical local trials are not required, and if your foreign, foreign trials follow the, the standards, one for one for five, for example, then you those trials can be accepted. Okay. Uh, next question is: Are there similar registration requirements and listing requirements for forensic devices? I don't know. Do you know anything about forensic devices, Mr. Ko? Uh, no. At this point in time, I don't think forensic devices are classified as medical devices itself. At this point in time, from what I understand, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions that I really can't understand what they're saying, so we're going to skip on those. Um, I guess the, the last question we have for today is, what advice would you give foreign medical companies looking to register their products in Singapore? If you do not have any um, local um, sources itself, it's best to really... Um, understand or read through the guidances that's being available on the HSA website to get a first touch and feel of it. And next, it's very key to to identify a right partner to help you get those uh, products into Singapore. Um, do your basic homework, I would say. Uh, know what the regulations are about and, and know your distributor because most cases the distributor would be able to at least um, you know provide some basic knowledge of the regulation. Choose a distributor who has the importer's license and the uh, wholesaler's license in place so that you don't have to worry about this headaches. And, and what you really need to focus on is, is just on the, on the sales aspect of things. Um, next is, is take into account that, you know, because of the fact that registration process can take time, time, and most of the time frames are not known, you need to work with the distributor also in, in coming up with strategies to try to bring in the product prior to the registration time in place. So, okay, well, I mean, you can also work with an independent third-party agent right. in Singapore, not your distributor, right? Right, that's right. Um, that's key. And especially for country, uh, companies, I would say here, stress is that if you only have one or two products and you don't intend to sell through a uh, distributor, considering the fact that a lot of the fees are quite expensive, then you might consider to work with a third party who, who already has this and, and you sell straight to the, the um, hospitals of your choice and, you know, you get away the middleman in the way the distributor. Okay, great. Again, Mr. Ko, thank you so much for staying up so late to make the presentation and answer our questions today. We really appreciate your help. Uh, we look forward to your feedback on the evaluations. We also look forward to having you join another webcast by Pacific Bridge Medical. So this is Ames Gross. I'm the president of Pacific Bridge Medical. Thank you for your attendance, and the webcast is now over. Have a nice day. Thank you.